Yeah. So, I mean, it was a good meetup. And like I said, too, when you're going to these meetups, a lot of the times, you know, you might find someone who's like, hey, I could help you with this aspect of your business or this, this. And I was speaking with with someone there. And uh, I mean, he's doing flips locally. They're doing like five to 10 flips a year. Mm -hmm. And they're not really active in wholesaling. But I was telling him about what we're doing and how we're needing funding on some things. And he's like, yeah, um, I was telling him about how we just got $50,000 lent to us on those houses in Texas. And he was like, if you ever need funds like that, let me know. Like, I want to do that. If I can get a, a 20% return on my money in a hundred days, I'll do that. So that's another like, you know, lender that I met there who seemed pretty lenient and laid back where there's some other people who have a very strict criteria when they're lending um, in a super long process. So that's, that's kind of cool. Those kind of connections. Um, yeah. So then pace showed up, there was probably like two, 300 people there. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So um, today I wanted to go over, um, and this made me think of this because this, this meetup I was at, um, you of course have people that are in sub two, people that already have a lot of experience and whatnot, but then you also have a lot of newer people. And I spoke with a lot of newer people and I'm, I'm kind of just, you know, picking their brain, seeing what their plan of action is, what they're trying to do, um, how they're going about it. And a lot of them, of course, are doing direct to agent outreach. They're cold calling agents, trying to get sub two deals because that's kind of the big trend that's that's been going on for a while. And that's kind of what we were doing heavily. Um, we still do it a bit. But uh, then when I'm speaking with people, I'm saying, well, how are you going about it when you're speaking with agents? And I kind of wanted to fo focus more on on sales training and follow up and what exactly we're doing in this meeting today, because a lot of people can have the framework, but minor little things they're doing on the phone are causing them to really not get deals. And when you're speaking with agents, a lot of people are going the route of, and I know I've touched on this one a bit before, but hey, are you open to doing sub two? Would your client be open to doing sub two? And these real estate agents, that's all they're hearing is, will you do Will you do sub two? Because um, someone will watch, you know, entry level YouTube videos, just hearing sub two and creative finance. And then that's all real estate agents are hearing because newer people that are trying to get in the industry, that's all they hear. So I would definitely approach it from, and like we've, like Alex and I've kind of talked about before with, with scripting and some of the videos we have, like we always want to approach it with the the aspect of, I'm not even mentioning creative finance. I want to disqualify cash or a traditional sale before I pivot into creative finance because everyone wants wants to do a cash sale, right? You have to justify why a cash sale won't work as to why you're pitching creative, right? Creative is going to be the alternative solution as to why cash didn't work. And if you're just calling an agent and saying, hey, will you do, um, will your seller do creative finance or sub two? Sure, you might get an agent that says, yeah, you know, maybe or what's that? And they'll be super nice. Um, a lot of times that won't be the case though. So oftentimes you're wasting your time if you're if you're just going about it like that. And a lot of people I was speaking with yesterday, um, I was talking to them and that's kind of exactly what they're doing. I'm like, well, what are you doing when you're when you're talking to agents on the phone? Well, I asked them if their if their client would be open to creative. And just that word creative. Um yeah, I'm gonna go to that one, Anthony, on Thursday. Um, I think. But yeah, we can post the details on that one in Discord. There's there's another meetup Thursday. It won't be as big. Pace won't be there, but this one's they do these pretty regularly at this hotel in West Hollywood. That's pretty nice. Um so yeah, we can post the details on that one. I'll probably likely go to that. I think Alex will as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of these, a lot of newer people that I'm speaking with, they're going of the approach of, let me just start calling agents and asking if they do creative finance. And, you know, so many agents aren't going to know what creative finance is. That's all they're going to hear. They're going to get annoyed and, and pretty much not going to want to take that call, right? That's why even if we're doing the typical approach and pitch, of trying to actually go through the whole process of not approaching it as a creative finance deal to start, then that agent is still going to get irritated just by getting a phone call now. Cause they're like, okay, my listing's getting 20 phone calls a week of people saying, Hey, will you do sub two? They probably don't even want to pick up their phone anymore. Cause it's the same people saying the same stuff. So to separate yourself from the pack, of course you want to start really sounding like, you know what you're talking about and not, specifically bringing up creative finance. So that's one thing for the agent approach that I wanted to touch on, but uh, more so of the the difference between when you're speaking with agents and speaking with sellers. 
that's something bigger that I wanted to touch on because when you're speaking with sellers, you're going to have a much different approach about that than you're going to have speaking with agents. When you're speaking with agents, you're not building like, there's no like emotional connection there. There's no rapport. There's no, I mean, of course you're building rapport, but the agent's more like the middleman, right? They're like the messenger. So when you're, when you're calling an on-market listing, the agent's literally just the messenger. So they're passing the message along to their seller and then it's back and forth. So it's going to be a lot harder to really kind of deliver something with, with meaning and potential like emotion to it and build a connection with that seller when the agent's the middleman. So that's one thing with, with when dealing with agents, I treat it a lot more just transactional where I'm just like, Hey, here's what we typically do. Here are the numbers. Here's this other offer I have that can still give the seller what they need, but it'll actually be better for them than the cash sale. Whereas if I'm going direct to seller and I'm speaking with sellers directly, I have a lot more leverage in that scenario because when I'm speaking with sellers directly, I can kind of tie into what's their motivation, what's their pain point, why do they want to sell, how can I help them get there, how can we paint that picture together? Whereas with an agent in the middle, we can't even really have that discussion. The agent could tell me, oh, the seller wants to move to Florida, and then that's all I hear. Whereas if I'm speaking directly to the seller, well, why do you want to move to Florida? How much money do you need to move to Florida? Um, what does that look like in Florida? Do you have family there, right? And I'm building a lot more of a connection. And that's going to lead to a more like emotional attachment to the outcome. And when that's the case, and if, I, if I'm basically saying like, hey, I want to team up and help you get to where you want to go, then that person's going to be more inclined to want to work with me and also be open to kind of the options we present. Whereas, like I said, with an agent, you're not really going to get that. It's just going to be more of a transactional based kind of messenger sort of scenario. So when you're going direct to seller, you definitely want to be more focused on kind of painting, you know, their, their picture in mind, their end goal picture of what they want to do and really dive into the motivation. Whereas you still want to do that with direct to agent, but with direct to seller, that's definitely going to be of more importance to, to dive into that there. Um, and I know I'm kind of rambling for a while here, so I just want to pause for a sec and see if anyone has any questions with that, like the difference between direct to agent, direct to seller, if you've been making calls direct to agent, how those have been going, or if you've making calls direct to seller, um, kind of with just some of the stuff I've been saying, the, the differences between the two, if anyone wants to chime in and add anything or, or ask any questions. Okay. No, no worries if there's no questions yet. Um, I just don't want to be rambling on for a while. But um, yeah, so the next thing that I want to touch on more so of is typically on like our Tuesday meetings, that's when we'll do more of like call role play, call review, sales training. Um, so I figured some people can't make Tuesday meetings. And then some people can only make Tuesdays and not make Saturdays. So I wanted to cover more so of kind of the sales. So a little bit of sales training in our sales process um, today. So I'm going to go over more of direct to seller stuff because we, we were doing a lot of sub two. Now we're not doing as much sub two, still doing a little bit of the sub two deals though. Um, the issue with the sub twos now though, I was just reading a post that a lot of these deals that you're seeing now are more of those interest rates between five to, to 7% because those houses that had those low interest rates three years ago now have equity in them. And it's a lot harder to get a sub two deal out of them. So, um, saw a comment there agents don't want to pick up calls is that the same with owners 100 percent, 110 percent, right because that, that there's going to be multiple factors in there that that will affect that um it's going to be your market and also the motivation of that list you're calling so some sellers they get tons of telemarketer like calls as well for people wanting to buy their houses and as you can imagine, right, when I get a when I get a call, I don't always answer my phone if I don't recognize that number. Sometimes I do. It depends what's going on. So a lot of the times sellers won't answer your calls either. That's why, like, when we're cold calling, we'll call a list like five plus times over again to catch people that didn't answer the first time. Um, I would actually probably say you have a better chance of getting responses from real estate agents than you do sellers. Like if you call 100 sellers, probably a handful will give you responses. Whereas if you call 100 agents, you'll probably get maybe like 20% will respond to you to your voicemail or answer your call. But um, direct to sellers is a different ballgame for sure. And 
I was talking to some people last night. They're like, how can I kind of start my business? How can I get it going? How can I start locking up deals? I just want something as soon as possible. And I said, well, like they were targeting Atlanta. That was their main market. They were targeting Atlanta, Georgia, calling for sale by owner lists. I said, well, for sale by owner, that's something that's out there that's totally free that anyone can grab and call on. So there's going to be a lot of saturation on calling for sale by owners. And then two, Atlanta is probably a top 10 market in the nation, 100% top 10 market in the nation, Atlanta, Georgia. So I told them, see everybody, and that meetup was crowded. There was probably 200 to 350 people there. And I say, see everybody in here, um, in this room right now. And then I pointed at a big table and I'm like, picture a tiny little grain of salt on the table. That's us, right? And everyone's trying to do the same thing. Where do you think these people are going to target, right? If you're looking at nationwide perspective, all the people trying to do this, they're probably going to target markets like Atlanta. They're probably going to target Vegas, Phoenix, like these larger markets. I'm not saying you can't do deals there, but if you're targeting like smaller, like B markets or kind of, you know, other markets that aren't as large and saturated, you're going to be getting results way quicker than you would if you were targeting Atlanta or Phoenix or super big markets. The thing is, though, when you do target those A markets, you're going to get larger assignment fees. You're going to have a bigger buyer pool, and it's going to be a lot easier to sell your deals. So that's the benefit. But if you're doing like outbound cold calling, targeting those A markets, you're going to notice you'll probably get, you know, maybe if you're targeting a B market, you might get 10 plus leads a week. Whereas if you're targeting an A market, you might get a couple of leads a week. It's just more saturated. There's more sellers that are getting their phones called every single day by, by, um, I wouldn't call it telemarketers, but by people who are trying to buy their houses. And that's going to lead to a lower response rate and more options for them to choose from. Uh, meaning why would they work with you? Why not just sell their house to someone else? So there's, there's so much that really goes into it in terms of like, hey, I need to pick a market. I need to pick a strategy. What should I do to actually try to get a deal? And I was telling those people like, hey, you're you calling for sale by owners in Atlanta, Georgia. That's going to be like a super, super way to not get a deal. Um, so tomorrow I got like a Zoom with them and they want some kind of consultation on it in terms of like, what should I do to try to get started? And basically me just saying those two things right there your list is the lowest the lowest barrier to entry for sale by owner. And then also to your market, everyone's gonna be hitting that market. And you guys are newer and don't know what you're talking about. So, and that wasn't me trying to be rude, but like them being newer as well, that means, okay, why would that person who's gotten called 20 times this week wanna sell their property to them versus someone else? And that was one of the big things in, when we were doing a decent amount of sub two deals is Myself and Alex were really good at, at handling objections and, and dealing with sellers on the phone and agents and explaining all this stuff, making people want to work with us. Versus if you're just calling someone and say, hey, will you do creative finance? You're not really separating yourself from the competition. So that's that's one thing I want to mention too, just a little bit in terms of like, hey, how often do these people pick up? Really just depends on the list you're calling in the market. Like if you're calling a list that's not super saturated, like three foreclosures, that's going to be a saturated list because that's just screaming motivation. These people are about to lose their houses. Don't get me wrong. You can get great deals from pre-foreclosures. We still call a bit of pre-foreclosures. Um, I know people that make huge fees calling pre-foreclosures, but it's one of the most commonly hit lists. So if you're calling like a pre-foreclosure list in Dallas, Texas, those people are getting calls all day long. But say if I picked like a smaller C market that had like a population of 70,000 or something like that, and I picked a different list other than pre-foreclosure, um, like maybe like, you know, a tired landlord list, still a little saturated, but not as much as pre-foreclosure, then I'm probably going to get way better response rate than I would calling that a market list um, than, you know, that that other list that um, is in that C market. You're calling expired listings. Expired listings are really good to call. Um, depends on the market, too. I'd be curious what market you were calling. Because we've called them, um, we're kind of list stacking right now. So there's different lists within our data, but I've narrowed it down before when we were targeting uh, expired listings in Phoenix pretty heavily. And that was super saturated. Like I had a couple people calling those lists for me. We had a couple leads. Um, one was about to convert to a deal, but their lender kind of blew up the deal um, who was who they were trying to get the new house from or the new loan from to for their new property. 
Um, so it depends on your market. Like expired listings are great, um, especially if you're trying to target sub two deals. Expires in Florida, Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville. Yeah, those are really good markets. Um, I'm curious how that's how that's been going for you because I know Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville are like the biggest markets in Florida. Florida is one of the hottest states in the country right now for real estate. So I'm assuming those are probably pretty saturated. Um, curious how that's been going for you. And then uh, Carter, what's the least called list? Um, honestly, least called lists would be lists that seem to have the the least amount of motivation, right? So if I just pulled, if I went on PropStream and I just searched high equity and pulled a list like that, I mean, you could set your filters for your list you want. Like when I was kind of starting this and I didn't know better, um, one of my partners I used to work with, we would pull like high equity stuff. Don't get me wrong. You can still for sure get deals in that hundred percent. Um, cause we were doing, you know, a deal or two a month, but, um, high equity, lists you're basically looking for a needle in a haystack right so shoot like my my i have family members right that would fall under high equity they have they've had their house for a while there's a lot of equity you're just hoping that you run into the right person who wants to sell their house at a discount and they can because there's equity so that would be like a lower saturated list because that data you're pulling you're looking for needle in a haystack that data isn't screaming motivation Whereas pre foreclosure screams motivation, water shut off screams motivation, expired listing screams motivation. Those lists scream motivation. And, but of course, with motivation comes more competition. So you're going to have more people calling those lists. But at the same time, I would rather call those lists than look for a needle in the haystack calling a high equity list. So that's just kind of a quick example there. Um, very true, Christian. You can still get deals in the big markets 100%. But exactly, yeah, you are competing with big dogs in that market for sure. Um, so, yeah, and I have done for sure. I've done deals in these larger markets, 100%. But that's not our main like focus and target of, hey, we're just targeting these big markets. We're probably targeting more of the B markets and the outskirts of the A markets. We'll still do stuff in the large A markets. It's just there's a lot of people targeting those those markets and Thus, you're going to get your offer shopped around a lot. So if I'm making an offer, um, I remember like a year ago, I had a really good deal in Dallas that we got from an outbound cold call lead. There was like an 80K spread on it, it seemed like. But of course, like it was one of those, well, I'm not signing right now. Um, and this was when I was newer and not as experienced. Okay, yeah, that's totally fine. Like, don't want to pressure you. Um, then they're basically shopping my offer around to the other 20 people that have called them that week. And then they got a higher offer and that other company seem more credible and whatnot. So that's the thing with outbound. Like I tell people, if you want to target these A markets like heavily and you want to see like quicker results, you probably want to run a PPC campaign because if you're running PPC, those sellers are coming to you. Those sellers are, are seeing your Google ads. They're clicking on your link and, you know, saying they want to sell their house on your website. Um, but of course, you can still get results doing outbound stuff, whether it's you guys, you know, cold calling, pulling lists, whether it's for sale by owner, direct to agent, direct to seller, um, that's just something that's general and it's going to be consistent in all markets, right? Whether it's direct to agent or seller, the larger A markets are going to be more saturated. Uh, the B markets won't be as saturated, but the thing is, it's going to be harder to move your deals and your fees probably won't be as big. That's another thing to consider. But yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that, Christian. And then just starting, very rarely someone picks up the call. That's one thing to consider too. Like you might want to switch out of those A markets. Um, I always tell people you got to find that balance of pivoting when it makes sense to pivot and not having shiny object syndrome. So, and that's an issue I used to have because there's some people I talk to where it's like a week, I want to try this a week. I want to try this a week. I want to try this. And then it's just like, you're never going to have like consistent data or consistent model to build off of. If it's like you're pivoting in a week or a few days like that. Um, and I've kind of been like that, not with real estate. Well, I guess previously with real estate, but also other things, right? Like someone's like, oh, I want to try drop shipping. I want to try stocks. I want to try this. Ooh, I see a wholesale course, right? Like something like that. But I tell people it's like, hey, if you give it a month or something like that for a specific list or a niche, you want to focus a specific market, and then you have data to analyze and you're like, wait, something's off here. Okay, now let me pivot. Then that makes sense. So it's like, if you've only been calling these Florida lists for two weeks or less, then I would say, Hey, maybe not pivot yet. Or 
what could be going wrong, right? Are you just dialing them individually off your cell phone? Is your cell phone number a Florida area code? Is your number being marked as spam? Um, are you calling one line at once? Are you triple, triple dialing, dialing five numbers at once? Like, how could you be more efficient to try to talk to more people? So that's another thing to consider too. Um, and then in terms of lists that I mainly call, we're kind of doing a lot of list stacking. So we have like a virtual driving for dollars list. We'll have a little bit of expires, a little bit of pre foreclosures, water shut off, tired landlord. That's kind of the main list we're doing now. Um, yeah, let me know how that goes, Anthony. You just skipped a expired list from Batch for West Covina. That could be good. And I don't really target a lot of stuff locally. We have done a little bit. Um, so I'd be, I'd be curious to see how that goes because I definitely know it's more saturated for... Uh, seems like all of Southern California is super saturated. Um, but the good thing is I know you're, you're local to LA. So if you know you have these conversations and say, Hey, I can meet up in person very soon. That's like leverage there. Um, cause someone I know who I'm, who I'm friends with that I met at the meetup last night, who I saw that I hadn't seen in a while. He was, uh, he specifically goes and door knocks pre foreclosures in the LA area and he makes a killing. He maybe gets one deal a month and he has a team of four people that do it for him. But he was like, Hey Jack. Um, and right. I'm looking at houses that are like 200 grand or less usually. Right. So I'm not making big fat spreads on them. Some of them have nice spreads, but like, he's like, Hey Jack, this house that's worth 900 something thousand, this much equity, we're trying to lock it up. There's like a 200 K spread. And he had like an assignment. Um, when I saw him like a month and a half ago, of like 160 K. Um, so he, he makes big fees cause he's targeting this market, but this market like is a lot more saturated and, uh, it's a lot harder to get deals done. So like that face to face model that he's doing of door knocking works. It's, it's definitely one of the best ways, um, I personally never done it for real estate, but that's something that I've been talking to him about. I'm like, huh, maybe we should try doing this nationwide and trying to get some door knocking teams going and trying to build something out of that. So something we're going to discuss more, but I mean, yeah, if you guys wanted to pull pre foreclosure lists, um, usually best for pre foreclosures, not really expired. I mean, you could do it with anything, but pre foreclosures are going to be like the most motivated lists and they get tons of calls where it's like, hey, if you go knock on their door and also leave like a post-it note or business card or something nice saying, you know, you can offer to help them out, that's going to really connect with someone better than you just cold calling them. Um, yeah, let me see here. Sorry, Anthony, this is random. Uh, where are you Where are you fishing at right now? Uh, I'm at uh, Glen Hallen Regional uh, Park. Oh, okay, nice, uh, nice. Yeah. Up here off the 15. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah I used to fish cool. a lot. <laughs> oh, I go all the time. Do a lot of uh, deep sea fishing too. So. Oh, nice. We'll have Where to talk about that more. another time. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, but uh, you were talking about, you know, I posted the thing about the expired list. So, yeah, West Covina is like my backyard. So, I figured, why not try it and see what's up? Um, the first house, I haven't called yet, but the first house I was looking at, I kind of did a little bit of comping uh, just to see what it was. And he was asking 575 at the time. That it was listed, but uh, the comps in the area were like high sevens, eight hundreds, and uh, and kind of you know. So it looks like it would be a good deal if I can find out what's going on, why he pulled it from the you know why why he wasn't able to get rid of it, you know. Yeah, how long was it on market for? Um, I that one I had to look at. I think it was um, one hundred eighty four days. Uh -huh. I think. And that's something that's weird too. Like I've had that happen before where I'll comp something. It looks like it makes sense. And then you're like, wait a second. My, my numbers are showing 700 K and this was on market for, for a hundred days at 600 K something's up that I don't know about. Or like there's times before where the market can just shift and change where it hasn't been shifting and changing too much in the last six months. But like, you know, your comps can be telling you one thing, but the open market is clearly telling you something else. And like in that instance, it's like, huh, I wonder what's wrong with that house. Or maybe there was some like slight discrepancy with the comping there or, Hey, there could just be something major that you don't know about that's wrong with the house. Yeah, for sure. I definitely want to find out more about, you know, I mean, all of them, you know, <laughs> like why, why they pulled, why they, why they weren't able to go, uh, why they were, you know, able to sell them and stuff. So yeah. Just curious more about having the conversation with them to ask them, you know, yeah. what, you know, what offers they did get, why didn't they take them? Were they from investors or were the people that couldn't qualify? You know, yeah. those questions. Totally. 
then I also saw your 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 comment too. Been looking into Lead Zolo or Auto Lead. I haven't heard of Auto Lead. Um, Lead Zolo. One of my old partners is using that now, having pretty decent results with it. Um, that's something that I also want to start doing soon. I don't know if we want to do Lead Zolo or um, doing maybe a little bit of PPL where you're paying for each lead. Um, but yeah, Lead Zolo is good running the YouTube ads. I know someone that does pretty well um, with Lead Zolo. But um, yeah, that's Auto that's Lead. Is, auto Lead is the, it's new. I think they're like going into their beta phase. It's uh, Eric Schmidt. I don't know if you uh, know his name at all, but. Um, yeah, he, you know, he's part of the development of that program. I mean, it's similar to Lead Zola and all those because he used to work with, uh, he used to work with RJ Bates. Um, oh, nice. But anyways, in any case, um, yeah, I just kind of been following him to see, but I signed up for the beta program, so we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> nice. Cool, yeah. cool. And then, and that's one thing too, like when you have inbound leads versus outbound, you're going to have the upper hand dealing with these sellers versus if you're doing outbound, you know, you're cold calling a seller, you're cold calling an agent, mainly the seller scenario though, the ball's in their court, right? Cause you called them. And I hear that a lot. Like, well, you called me, tell me what you're going to offer. You called me, tell me that. But when someone inbound comes to you off of like an online marketing campaign, the ball is kind of in your court. Like they're desperate. They reached out to you. The dynamic is kind of shifted. So um, usually the conversion rate on those PPC leads are like, closer to one out of 20 or the conversion on like direct to seller, whether you're cold calling text blasting or something like that is closer to like one out of 90 or something like that. One out of 80 um, roughly. Um, and then Christian, I was wondering why investors with experience were locking up deals in cities I'd never heard of. Yeah. Less competition for sure. Um, the only downside is though, like it's, it's harder to move some of those deals sometimes in those, in those smaller markets, if you're trying to wholesale them. Um, that's the only downside of that. And the spreads are often smaller because one, there's not as much, there's not as many buyers that are hungry, willing to pay over your ask. And then two, the, uh, the buyer's pool is definitely going to be minimal because, um, everyone's buying in like those a markets preferably. Right now we're not doing PPC. We're doing a little bit of PPC like two months ago with a partner. Um, but currently we're not, we'd like to do like a larger campaign, um, something we're definitely thinking of soon. It's just PPC is expensive. Like to run a good PPC budget, you probably want at least $5,000 a month being thrown into the campaign. Because if you're doing less than 5K a month, um, it's not really worth it. And that's kind of the general census I've heard from a lot of people that are doing PPC at scale successfully. Um, I've heard different though with like face, if you're doing Facebook ads and like Lead Zolo, I have some partners that are throwing like a couple grand a month at it and they're doing well. Um really just depends um yeah because i mean it's and that's the thing that's scary about scaling your business right like you can throw a bunch of money into something and you're never of course nothing's ever guaranteed in life but especially like hey i want to throw 10k at this marketing campaign for ppc i know if i threw 10k at a marketing campaign for ppc there's a 90 percent chance that 10k would turn into 30k of assignments because that 10k is probably going to bring two deals um, and typically your assignment fees are larger, um, with inbound stuff too, just cause I said like the ball is kind of in your court. And, uh, one of my good partners who's been running PPC when he started his campaign out of his first four PPC leads, he got two deals off of his first four, which are really good. Like, like I said, typical conversions, like one out of 20 or so, depending on your, your sales process. Um, and then now he's been running his PPC for like almost two months since then. And he hasn't done a deal. So he got like two literally in the first week and a half or less than that, I think. And then for like a month and a half after that, not, not a, not a lead that's converted to a deal. And he spent like, um, like five, 5,000 more in marketing or something like that. Um, so it's, it's been over like 20 leads he's gotten now without a deal. So, and I, I remember, and I'm much better on the phone now than I was like a year ago, but I remember like a year ago when I took a break from working with one of my old partners, me and a buddy, we went halves on PPL leads. So it's like PPC, except you're not running a campaign. You're just paying for each individual lead. And we bought like 10 leads and each lead was like 300 bucks. So we spent like three grand on leads, um, primarily in Vegas, we were targeting and uh, we didn't convert one of those deals, one of those leads. But that was kind of before I really was doing novations, creative finance, sub two. We were just pitching like the cash, but 
you know, that was us throwing $3,000 out there hoping to get a deal that would thus then pay us over 15 K in an assignment, which didn't happen. But I mean, right now when you're offering like novations sub two slash seller finance is another option as well, probably going to get a higher conversion rate than one out of 20. Um, Cause I know one guy that does that and he's closer to like the mid teen range um, on his conversion rate, but uh, definitely something we're going to, we're going to start doing in the next couple months is, is running the PPC. And let me see here. It's funny, Alex and I, Alex is a lot more organized than myself. Um, like, like it's funny. Like Alex will build a lot of stuff out. He's more like the integrator. And then this is this is me for the meeting here. I have my little post-it out with uh with a bunch of notes on it that I just wanted to touch on. Um, so that kind of set it up perfectly though for me kind of wanting to touch on the different options in terms of like a sales sales training process, like anchoring cash. So. A lot of people, I'd say most people in the industry are adapting now, at least those that are doing well, they would just offer straight cash. Like, okay, here's here's your offer cash. I'm offering $70,000 cash. That's where we're at, right? And you might have a little buffer of like your max allowable offer might be like 85K or 90. But if you're just offering a seller firm, hey, I'm here cash, it's this or the highway, you piss a lot of people off. Um, and I know that because that's all I was doing. Like my first six months in this industry was cold call. We didn't really do creative finance. It was all just like cash offer, just kicking the knees. Like, dang, I'm pissing these people off. Unless it was the needle in the haystack person who was like, and these were the kind of deals I was doing. Vacant house, squatter, fire damage, major issue going on in the family. Called them. They happen to answer right place, right time. Let me just sell. And that makes it a lot harder to do a decent amount of, of deals um, when you're only pitching cash. So what we're doing now for direct to seller stuff, and this is like the best model to use, um, is Eric Brewer, he's he's like a, a novation guy. He has a good sales training script and, and program that I'm in. But we're basically following that model of the only time you're bringing up cash to anchor. Just like when we were teaching the sub two stuff, like you're not buying this cash, you know, cash won't work, but you still want to throw out cash to anchor them. So right now, when we mention cash, cash does work still, like we're locking up cash deals, but 95% of the time, the cash offer you give will be too low for that person. Because in all reality, what percent of people are actually going to sell their house for 60% of what it's worth? Not many, right? Not many. Um, but with with kind of our sales process and scripting we use, um, you know, if anyone's in mentorship groups here and whatnot, Eric Brewer's Novation course is really good. And we're kind of using his framework where I know some people really like, and I haven't dove into any of his sales training, but RJ Bates is more like quick, straight to the point. Where Brewer and some of these other guys, it's like, okay, they're like closing phone calls are going to be like 20 minutes long. And that's kind of what I like because we're like basically setting the framework, setting the stage. Um, the Novation King is a different guy, actually, Anthony. So Novation King is Rich Wonders, and then Eric Brewer is a is a separate guy. But I have both of their courses. Um, I like Novation King a lot as well, too. He's he's cool. Um, but um, yeah. So with the with the cash, like I said, it's not going to work all the time. That's more of the anchor. But I'd much rather give an anchor like that and instantly pick up the anchor. And when I was working on another team that had a really good PPC system in place, I got really good sales training from them. Um, and they got, they introduced me to like Brewer and Steve Trang and those guys where basically your cash offer when you're speaking with a seller, it's never going to be like, well, I'm going to offer you 55,000. It's like, well, you know, other, like I said, we are an investment company. Like you're pre-framing all this stuff leading up to this, like in our pre-framing slash like setting the stage, we're saying like, you know, as an investment company, you do have to understand we're investors. Like we do have to make a reasonable profit on each deal um, or we wouldn't be a very good company. Right. And then, you know, kind of chuckling, building rapport. And then you're saying right when you're getting up to the point of like actually making the offer. So investors in the area that are buying properties off market, just like yours, that are also three bed, two baths, about 1200 square feet, they're paying roughly anywhere from 80,000 to $110,000 um, per property. Is that something that, that range, would that work for you? Or is, or is that something that that's probably a little too low? Probably not. 
so right there, I've basically set an anchor of what other investors are paying for properties like the sellers in that area. And I've set a wide anchor range. So I've set a super low offensive anchor. And then my upper range is a little better, but probably still offensive. So usually that range I give is going to still be below my max allowable cash offer. So let's say my max allowable cash offer for me to wholesale the deal is 120. And I just gave them a range of 80 to 110. I still know 120 is as high as I can go if I want to try to make a deal work there for cash. So say if they came back to me, they're like, whoa, no, that's way too low. That's way too low. And they're starting to get mad, which that happens a lot when you lowball the hell out of someone on their house. Um, then I instantly just pick up that anchor and I say, yeah, yeah. That's why I didn't even mention that offer. I didn't even want to offend you because I knew something like that wouldn't work. So now you're kind of the good guy again. You're not the bad guy who just offered them 60% of what their house is worth. So you pick up that anchor and then from there, you know, you kind of try to dive deeper in terms of like, well, what's your bottom dollar? Because they just disregarded what I just offered. So then they could tell me, well, originally they could have said they wanted 240. Um, then they then they came down to 200. Now I just gave them the super low range. And then they tell me, hey, I'll actually do um, one, 140, whatever. Um, and my max allowable cash offer was 120. So I'm like, wait a second. This will probably work for an ovation now. Like my max allowable offer for an ovation could be 150 and they're at 140. And let's say the house is worth 200. There's still a spread right there for an ovation to make a little bit of money. So then I could pivot into my novation pitch. And the whole point of that is if I started with the novation, we have this program where we actually kind of like team up together and it's a hands-off experience for you though, but I can give you the net price you want of 140 and I'll do any sort of repairs, any renovation, any renovations, anything that someone may request. Um, and it's hands-off for you, right? Because a lot of times when, when you try to buy a house with a conventional loan, there's going to be repairs, inspection reports, retrades. You won't deal with any of that. And I'll market your property out to my large pool of buyers and possibly the open market and offer to do any re renovations upon request. If I started with that pitch, the seller's just going to be, why the hell aren't you giving me cash, right? Like, what's this thing you're telling me about? I want cash for my house. So that's just like the sub two stuff. If you're just starting with, hey, will you do sub two? Hey, will you do an ovation? Um, we don't call it an ovation. We have like a specific term for it. Equity protection plan, we call it. But if you're never starting with the cash offer to anchor them, then none of these other options can make sense. Because why the heck would someone want you to list their property for two months um, if you're presenting that as your first option? Same with sub two. Why would someone want to do a sub two unless you've already disqualified it heavily and made that the, the reason why you're giving this other option? So we're always anchoring that low cash range that's offensive, but not saying we're offering it. We're saying other people are offering it. And then if they agree and say, hey, that range might work, then I know that could be a cash deal. But then if they tell me that that range is way out of the where they need to be, then I agree with them and understand and pivot to an ovation or a seller finance or sub two. So then I've anchored them with that cash in a non-offensive way. So when you're doing that sales process that I just described, your conversion is going to be a lot better than you just pitching only cash. Um, wondering if anyone has any questions with that before I kind of jump on to the, uh, the next thing here that I wanted to mention. Any questions with that in terms of kind of pitching cash, anchoring that, novations, seller finance or sub two stuff or kind of just that general sales process um, overall. All right, no problem, no problem. So yeah, that's, that's just uh, what we're doing. And that's what a lot of people are doing. There's some people that I know that like, aren't really even trying to do many cash deals. It's just, it's happening that most of the, most of the time the innovation works for them perfectly. Because like I said, 90% of the time cash offer won't work for people. And you're kind of just using the cash offer as an anchor for innovation. Um, because the innovation, you know, that's going to be still won't work 90% of the time, but the innovation might work 85% of the time. And cash offer works less, way less than that. Cause your innovation I'm I'm sure you guys know like your your general cash offer formula is going to be 70% of ARV minus repairs is like your formula that you use typically that's just a broad number it can vary per market and price of house but 
70% of the after repair value minus the repairs minus your wholesale fee. That's typically what you offer. So let's say, for example, and this is just me pulling out a calculator here on my phone. Let's say ARV was 200000 on a house. Um, so 70% of that is $140,000. let us say repairs were 20000 So now I'm at one twenty, And let's say I wanted to make a 10K fee. Now I'm at 110000 So the ARV on their house, that's worth 200. Their house is worth 200K ARV, needs a bit of repairs. I want to make a fee. My offer is 110000 on that person's house. Whereas if I wanted to do an ovation on it, um, house, let's say, as is condition is worth 180 because we'd subtract roughly that that uh, 20K of repairs. 180 times 90. And this is answering uh, your question right here, how to calculate a max allowable offer for an ovation. Typically, you're going to do 90%. And this is just a quick one. Like I have some long calculators and stuff, but this is like just the basic one that a lot of people use. 90% of the as-is value minus your fee. So as-is value is an ARV. As-is value is, okay, let me look at some comps that sold that seem a little outdated, might need a little bit of work. Depends on the condition of the house, right? So as-is value could be a house that's turnkey and in great condition. Then I would just look at comps that are in the same condition. So that would mean as-is value. So in this case, as-is value the house is worth ARV 200K, it needs about 20K work. So I'll say as is value is about 180. So 180,000 times 0. 0.90, that's 162 uh, minus my desired fee. So my last offer, my cash in this scenario was going to be like 110,000 if I wanted to make a 10K fee. In this one, if I wanted to make a 10K fee, my offer is 152. Um, with the novation though, you usually want to have a bigger spread than that just to account for any discrepancies or error. Um, like Rich Wonders, who's the, the Novation King guy, he does a 30K fee minimum. So he'll he'll always account for a $30,000 fee. But I mean, shoot, even if I aim for a $30,000 fee here, um, my offer would be 132000 versus 110000 So that's a 22K difference of what I'd be able to offer that seller in that scenario with me making 30K versus me making 10K. Um. So shoot, you don't have to make 30K. You could, you know, do a 20K assignment or fee, I should say. So that's, and just to kind of recap that for an ovation, um, to find out what your max allowable offer is, 90% of the as is value minus your fee, which Rich Wonders, who I learned that formula from, he does a $30,000 fee is what he aims for. So he does 90% of the as is value minus $30,000. And I like that. I like that because that gives you a decent amount of wiggle room, the $30,000. So if you F something up in your numbers, you having a $30,000 spread already anticipated. Um, if you had to cut into that five or 10K for something, then, hey, that gives you wiggle room. Versus if I only had a 10K spread on it, I probably wouldn't do it because something could go wrong, something minor needs to be touched up or fixed, and then I just waste the time. And then, let me see here. Cody messaged me and said, do you flat fee list your novations or do you hire another agent? Um, I haven't done a ton of novations. I've only done like a handful. Um, well, a couple are in the process right now and I've, I've done one previously, but general census for people that do a lot of them is hire an agent because basically if you're flat feeing them yourself, you're running a whole like project management, right? You're, you're navigating showings, reaching out to buyer's agents, setting everything up, lockbox, this, 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 and you're doing a lot of work that's taking away time from your business versus if you just hired another agent that was, a, you know, a good agent in that area, in that market, they're going to handle all that for you. So yeah, sure. They're going to get a percentage for their commission, but it's hands off for you. So I can go back to business and go lock up, you know, more innovations, do more deals, do whatever I'm doing and just pass it off to the agent who's going to be more skilled than me in that market anyway. So I'd much rather do that than um I'd much rather do that than just flat fee list it and be super involved with it. And then if you're if you're using an agent, how do you work that into the numbers? Um so I have a I have a calculator um from Brewers from Brewers Group where it pretty much does all that. Um so it'll and I could um that's the thing, like with the sub two stuff, like, oh, this is a private document you're not supposed to share. I think that's kind of the same with the brewer calculator 
but um, pretty much it'll account for that in that calculator. So you can like check off, are you using a, a flat fee broker or an agent? Um, you know, sort of things like that. But um, so you said, does that account for that 200K, 90%? So yeah, the thing is, if you're using the the agent, that's just going to be a couple percent difference right there. So that might be, in that case for the two hundred thousand, that's probably an additional like five or six grand or something like that. So when you have a thirty k spread, that's what some of that wiggle room's for there. But then also too, if you're listing it at ninety percent of the as is value, that's something meaning like, hey, I'm going to mark this at a ten percent discount from other things that look like my property that are selling. So if I'm marketing at a 10% discount, the whole goal of that is for it to sell more quickly. Um, so ideally with that, you're going to move that property. Say if average days on market in that city is 50 days, with you giving a 10% discount, your days on market might be um, 20 days or less or something like that. That's the goal, just to sell these quickly. So you could theoretically maybe bump it up slightly above the 90%. But that also, in, in turn, may result in a longer days on market till you sell it. But right there, it doesn't really account for that, though, which is that general formula I gave you of 90% of the as is value. If you use a listing agent, then, of course, you'd factor in a couple percent out of that off of your spread from that 30K. But, uh, yeah. So, Sorry. Um, Cody just messaged. Let's see. So if listing with realtor, 200K, 90% of that. Um, so 85% minus my four minus my fee, 4% for the realtor. Um, yeah, pretty much that's what it'd be, you could say. Totally. Or that's the other reason too. When you're accounting for like a 30K spread, um, that's stuff that could be factored into there without really having to worry about it. Because that 30K spread is pretty large. So like agent commission won't really touch your 30K spread too heavily unless it's like a house worth more than like 400 grand. Um, but of course, too, I'll have to see if I can share that because I don't really mind. But the only issue is it's like, oh, if I share something and then one person in there is like, oh, they're sharing this. I'm in this mentorship group. I spent $8,000 for this group. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Uh, so I have to check to see if if that one is, if the calculators are private, which I think they are, but that calculator I use, it's, it's pretty good because it, it can account for all those things. Um, there's a lot of different factors that accounts for in there. Like, do you want to market it at a discount? So it sells quicker. If not click this, 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 and then it can give you kind of like a bunch of different ranges, what to offer. Um, and with that calculator, it'll show your max allowable cash offer, your max allowable novation offer, and kind of gives you the whole rundown there. Um, Correct. Any uh, any questions or anything from anyone there on kind of what we were covering? I know we kind of covered a bit about novations, just general sales process in general, cash, creative, um, kind of anchoring with, with cash to pivot into novations and creative options. Just wondering if anyone else had any questions there, because I know there's been a decent amount of questions in the chat. Just wondering if anyone wanted to say something or, you know, type another question in there. Now's the time. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I asked, um, where's the best place to pull lists? But as soon as I asked that question in the chat, my internet connection dropped. So I don't know if you're interested or not. Oh, gotcha. No worries. Yeah. I don't even think that actually went. Oh, sorry. I see it. It went through. Yeah. So the best place to pull a list, um, that one's tricky. Honestly, it depends what list you're pulling. So like prop stream won't have like, fresh active county data like some people i know uh sam singh he'll he'll pull data from direct to the county um so sam, sam's approach is a lot more precise where he'll pull direct super hot data from the county and his conversions like one out of 40 almost for direct to seller leads which is really good like really really good just single dial top tier data from the county then it's like, hey, if you're trying to blast and call three plus phone numbers at once and treat it more like a numbers game than, you know, pulling like a, a tired landlord sort of list, a water shut off list, um, a pre foreclosure list, then that's kind of like the best bet to to pull, you know, um, those other lists. But in terms of where you're pulling your list from, PropStream and Batch are like the two go to that people use. The data isn't the greatest on there. 
but um you know it's still decent data kind kind skip tracing is another good place um they're they're pretty reasonable per record um but i mean prop stream prop stream is is good same with kind um the thing is with me i have a lot of people on my team that do that the data stuff for me like i'm not really the integrator who's who's pulling the data and doing stuff like that i'm more of like the you know closer um you know closing deals doing that kind of thing running meetings and stuff like that so i'm not super involved with the pulling data side of things okay. but just oh. when i when i used to pull data i was pulling from prop stream and and kind kind skip tracing Okay, so just a quick follow up. Um, say we pull a list from PropStream, um, and like when you use a uh, auto dialer or or a text blaster, usually on a CRM of some sort, usually it, it asks you if they opt in so that you can text them. Um, how do you text blast a bunch of people that you just pull a list from, but they didn't opt in? Yeah, so that's a good question. I haven't done a text blast. Probably in like eight months, I used to do some text blasting, but those rules and regulations are always changing for for text marketing, um, and that was one of the reasons I stopped because I was using shoot, I forgot one of the common, it was a common, it was a service that was just used for text blasting. That's all you could do with it. Can't remember the name of it now, but then on one of my old CRMs, I think it was REI Reply. I would text blast, and then they updated it to stay compliant with the regulations and every single person had to opt in. And when you do that, it doesn't look like a personal text. It looks like a, a blast, right? So I stopped doing it. And I've heard other things from people like the text blasting is kind of getting a little messy and isn't the greatest right now because those rules and regulations are just getting stricter and stricter and always changing. So that's something I've just stayed away from recently, the text blasting. So I wouldn't hundred percent know what site or service would be the best for the text blasting. Cause that was an issue I had having, people have to opt in. And I think that's just standard practice and regulation now um, that a lot of these sites will use where the, the the end user has to opt in. I appreciate it, man. Thanks. Yeah. And then, so with the Novation pitch, you got to rehab first, then Dispo. So you don't necessarily have to do any rehab at all. Um, you can just list them as is in the current condition. Um, really just depends. Depends how you, you approach it with the seller. I mean, we'll say like, we basically will we'll clean the property up a bit, you know, make it look nice, somewhat nice for the pictures, at least, unless it's like a complete major fixer. Um, and then basically in your listing, you can have something that says renovations upon request. So that's kind of one of the things that I don't know if it was Brewer or Rich Wonders who taught that, but basically having that verbiage allows you to just list the property as is on the market. And if the seller says anything, basically you're offering repairs upon request. So if a buyer comes in play and says, hey, I want this, I want that you can do it and just factor it into the price, you know, post closing and outsource it to a contractor or something like that. But you don't really have to do any rehab before the dispo unless you want to. And there's a bigger spread there because there's one deal we're working on right now outside of Philly. We've been working on it for a while that uh, has something where we're trying to do the rehab first, but it's a big mess right now. That deal. Um, apparently the seller was going through like a bankruptcy that they, yeah, it's just messy. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. And then Monica, 411,000 appraisal value. Mortgage is at 196K at 2%. Uh, mortgage company asking. Oh, the mortgage company is asking for 68K to get it out of foreclosure. So basically it's 68,000 in arrears essentially to, to catch up the, to catch the loan current. Is that the case? Yes. Okay. And I have another appointment today, um, but this home seems like they just ran out of the home. Um, but when I was looking at the pictures, it seems like it's a, it's like a condominium and it's connected. Uh -huh. So I don't even know if it's a good idea. I have an appointment at 430. It is with a sales agent. Um, and that one's going for 3349. Uh -huh. Um I'm not sure. I still have to go look at the comps. I haven't gotten a chance to look at that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't sure. Like, does it look like it rents for a lot? Huh? Does it look like it rents for a lot? Um. Actually, people own those condominiums in there, and it seems like this situation seems like a foreclosure, also. Yeah. And the 
because they left everything there. There's furniture. It's a mess. Uh -huh. The colors of the room is pretty horrible. So it's kind of neat, but it looks like everything else, like the kitchen and all that, seems to be in really good condition. I mean, just need maybe some paint and I'm thinking carpeting because the carpet looked like it was worn out, but that seems to be on the lower level. Gotcha. It's a three yeah. bedrooms, two bath. No, sorry. Three bedrooms, three bath and a half. It's pretty big. It looks like, you know, like a house, but yeah. it's a condominium. They're attached to other. Yeah. Gotcha. Ones. So, I mean, the main thing there would be to see like what your expected cash on cash return would be. Because the thing is, sixty eight thousand to to bring the loan current is a lot of money, and let's say the house it was appraised. Usually, the appraisal value is slightly below the market value. Um, so let's say the market value is four fifty or something like that. You know, sixty eight k to bring the loan current. Um, potentially, seller probably wouldn't be getting any cash in this scenario. Who knows? But cash to seller if there was any, and then you trying to make an assignment fee. You're looking at an entry fee, at least at least you know seventy five k probably over 80. So then right there at an $80,000 entry fee, that's like almost a 20% entry. So no one, you wouldn't be able to assign that to anyone unless the cash flow was insane. Like if the cash flow was, oh, I don't even know, honestly, because there's no PITI here in terms of what their total monthly payment would be and then what the rent rate would be. But I mean, if it was cash flowing really nicely as a long-term rental, like at least 500 plus a month, then, then you could you know, there's a chance to move it, but if there's no cash flow there and the entry fee being 80 grand, if you're trying to make a fee off of it, it's going to be pretty tricky. But let me know how that progresses though, when you get more info on it. And you said you had an appointment yeah. today, right? Yeah, but that's, uh, it's two totally different house. One uh, of them, okay. one of them is my, my home. The other one, well, it's not my home. It's my parents' home. Um, yeah. either my son's going to buy it, but we're trying to be creative on what to do. Should he, re should he finance the whole thing or should he just pay off, get a loan to pay off the 68,000 or should I negotiate and turn it into a sub two for him? And that's what he's trying to, we, we're trying to do, or either I have another investor, a friend of mine, um, Tim Farkas, he used to do my deals years ago. Um, I still have to talk to him, but I'm trying to see how I'm going to bring it up to his attention. The other house is at 430 and that's the one that's going for 3349. Um, she didn't want to give me a lot of information on it. She wanted me to meet her and look through it and then gotcha. give me the information. And then Zillow called me a few times. Um, I don't know, I found this like, out of, I don't know, it just kind of popped up on my phone. So I looked into it and I saw that it seems like it's been, you know, like nobody's living in it. They left it there and they're trying to sell it. I guess she, re she must represent the mortgage company probably. Gotcha. And one thing to mention too, that I didn't really think of, um, cause I was just analyzing it from a sub two perspective when I saw interest rate and that there, and I was just thinking it from that, but there is a lot of equity in this one. So this one could be like a sub tail where, you know, you take it, you take over the loan, you, um, you bring it current and then you flip it. Cause you have like, you have 264 K, um, of, of debt on the house, right? Cause you have to pay off 68 K and then you'd have the underlying debt of 196. So if it appraised it for 11, probably worth a little more than that. So you'd have a decent spread there if you just wanted to flip it too for for to get some equity out of it. So you could always do that. It's just like, are you? Where's How much the would 60? be the equity? What was that? How much would be the equity? Well, I mean, if you're looking at the debt perspective, you'd have uh, you'd have like roughly two sixty. You'd have two sixty four a debt if you're looking at what you need to do to bring the loan current and the remaining balance. So you'd have four eleven minus two sixty four. You have like, like one one oh two. You'd have like one fifty K of equity. Oh okay. If the appraisal value is similar to what market value is currently. So I mean that's enough spread there if you wanted to flip it, but I don't know the condition of the house if it needs repairs and whatnot, but definitely seems like it does. There. Yeah. It does. Um, because that's another issue. I have a claims check for twenty five thousand and um let's see. And that's for the roofing, uh, the kitchen needs to be redone, and the bathroom upstairs, the ceiling part of it, yeah. and, and the bathtub. So, and I'm thinking the flooring too. So if you estimate something like that, um, I don't know the constructions part of it, like the estimation, I used to know that, but that was years ago, like 2000, yeah. between 2000, 2006, I'm thinking. Um, so what is the, what is that value nowadays? Um. Sorry, you said 
You said thirty dollars a square foot. Sorry. Yeah, what did the you... bathroom. To me, the bathroom needs to be done. I'm um, thinking more of the, the the tub and the wall, the ceiling because of the roof leaking. It was causing the ceiling to get a little moldy. Uh, um, new vent for sure. New fixtures. The kitchen needs to be done. The cabinets to me are old. And then the flooring in the family room needs to be done downstairs and in the hallway upstairs. So that sounds not that like a company. not like a gut rehab, but that definitely sounds like, you know, more than a cosmetic fixer. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's probably it's hard to put a price per square footed on that without seeing it. But that sounds like at least, you know, 20, 30 K a work minimum. OK, so that would just be my guess. So, not numbers, seeing any fix. so yeah, just an estimated amount. So like to be able to flip it or wholesale it, like assign it to somebody else. Yeah, um, well, that would that, be. Yeah. How much would you charge as a wholesaler to sign it? Yeah, let me see here. Let me pull up my calculator and just this is just going to be very broad. It's not going to be like, hey, this is exact what I think because I, I haven't seen pictures and I don't know what the market value is because usually the appraisal is a little lower than market. So I'll just assume right now just to be kind of safe. I'll just say that the market value is like 420. So um, let me see here. 196 plus 68, 264, 420 minus 264 um so that's I can, like i can give you the address so you can pull it up okay gotcha yeah i was just about a um actually yeah sure i can pull it up if you don't mind if, if people see it or i could just look at it myself whatever you want okay i but mean it's gonna... 7495 okay mm -hmm. creek c-r-e-e-k four in canal winchester ohio All right, let's see here. I, I have like 30 days. I had a I had no choice but to file like a chapter 13, but I have 30 days to decide either take it out of the chapter and then flip it, sell it, wholesale it or whatever. So this, so I need so to this know is, if there's any money even in it. This is your property? That's my property, yes. Gotcha, okay. So it's my parents, but they're giving me like everything, I can literally take the mortgage company and I guess switch it over to my name, the attorney said by Wednesday. Uh -huh. Um, and then I can do whatever I need to do with it. Gotcha. And move forward. <laughs> yeah. So I'm seeing, uh, yeah, in terms of like an exact value on it, let's just say right around 400,000 or something like that. Cause Zillow's obviously these aren't accurate. Like it's just estimates. Zillow saying 378, my prop stream showing 404 appraisal was 412 or 411. So I'll just say 400 just to kind of round it there just to be a little conservative maybe. Um, so in terms of that, like what a wholesale would be. Um, so a wholesale would probably be, let's say there's 30 grand of repairs. I'm just going to say 30 grand of repairs. Well, and that's something, right? So this is, if this is your place, I wouldn't wholesale it, right? Because then you're like, when you wholesale a deal, you're you're kind of selling a deal to an investor off market where they're going to profit as much as possible off of it. Um, so okay. like some, something in this case, I would probably um, have like, what's your timeline on this? Have you thought about just listing it? That's what I was, uh, that was another um, I was going to mention. Like, yeah, should I list it? Should I wholesale it to another investor? Should I put it on the Facebook, you know, yeah. the creative thing with it, Pace? It um, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a wholesale since you own the house. Like, a wholesale would be okay. okay. You get someone else's property under contract, and you assign it to an investor for a cash price. Um, okay. That's the thing, right? It really depends on the work and how much the house needs. Because if you list something on market right now that le needs a ton of work, an investor might, an investor buyer might buy it all cash. But uh, that could be kind of tricky. It it really depends. Um, like you know, you list houses on market that are in good condition and can you know get. FHA, VA loans, you know, financing on them. Those are the ones you list on market. You can still list fixer uppers on market, but um, you'll probably get an investor cash buyer anyway who comes in to buy it. But um, yeah, like, what did we say? There, It seems like there's 150, at least 150 equity in there, not accounting for repairs though. So then if you're accounting for repairs, you know, I'd still say you at least have 100,000 equity. So um. Yeah, 
and the thing is, I mean, shoot, it, it really just depends. You'd have to see what your net would be. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think here. Because if you did sell it to a cash buyer, they would probably give you... Um, what was your underlying debt on it? Let me scroll up again. I mean, they'd probably give you not much more than what you have in terms of underlying debt. I feel like they'd be giving less than a $300,000 offer for sure on that if it was all cash. Um, and your debt is, is kind of close to that. I mean, what's your goal? How much are you trying to walk away with ideally? Honestly, I, I don't know, but I was trying to figure possible. out the numbers because at first I thought we had to add another 45,000 because on the mortgage statement, it shows 45. Oh, you just muted yourself, Monica. Hello? Yeah, I hear you now. Hello? Okay. Um. Yeah, on the... And the note it shows another forty five thousand deferred, which I don't know what that means. It says deferred payment, so I don't know if that's already included in the one ninety six k. But what we got at because I asked the the mortgage company for a payoff, uh -huh. and all they sent me was sixty eight thousand. <laughs> huh. So, <laughs> you know what? Um, if, if you you're want wondering if the payoff for foreclosure. <laughs> yeah, if you want, Monica, um, you're you're in Discord, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if, if yeah and that's want... another thing. By mistake, I clicked mute because I'm, oh my gosh, I'm like, um, my daughter's calling me spaz. So <laughs> by mistake, I pressed mute and I don't know how to get out of it. And no I think I muted it somehow. I still see your messages, like everybody's, you know, for the Zoom and everything, but I don't know yeah. if I'm still on mute or unmuted. I don't know how to get out of it. Though. I can hear you. I can hear you right now. Are you talking about just being muted in Discord or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's. You can see your messages. If if you post something, I'll be able to see it. But if you want to message me on Discord or text me, um, let me uh, let me see here. Shoot, that's about to be a DM. Let me just put it in the group chat. If you want to text me, Monica, I'm just kind of I wouldn't say all over the place right now, but you know, like I was just talking about other stuff, and then um, I want to look at this though and and analyze it and see kind of what your best option would be. Um, okay. Just give you my thoughts on it. But if you could text okay. me. And then also, if you wanted to text me too, like the payoff from the mortgage company and kind of just all the info you've kind of been given so far, because um, I know you said 40 something thousand was deferred, but I feel like that's probably built into the 68K, I'm guessing, to bring the loan current. Uh, or I'm not sure. I'd, I'd kind of want to just see like yeah. the the stuff they've sent I'm, you. Um, I mean, to... I'll send you docs because I have yeah. the docs and everything. I can just attach them and send them to you so you can see them. Okay. It's so confusing and... I need to make a decision that right now I have seven days to turn in documentations for the bankruptcy, but honestly, I don't want to ruin my credit. Like I've been, yeah, I have been working on my credit for a long time and yeah. everything happening and everything. So it's either sell the house or I have one, two, three, four possibilities of investors here that um, I know. Yeah. Um, actually, one of them happens to be my son because he's like, I'll buy the house. And then he'll stay in it. Um, but um, am I supposed to just sell him the full house or can he just get like saying like do a sub two and have him pay, bring in the 68,000. But then what do you do with that 196? Because the 196 at 2%. That's yeah, a I good mean, deal. if your son wants to live in it, I would, I would have totally sub to it then. I would have him take over the, the existing loan with that low interest rate and then just figure out how he's going to come up with that that 68 yeah, to get the 68 he has good um with wells fargo so and being that the house does have the equity does it have it i mean do you see it yeah how no, would I, I structure it the, in a the only yeah the only issue that i'm trying to think though is if you're saying to use the the house as equity to pull out equity on the house like get a heloc maybe to to uh, uh i'm trying to think i don't know if you'd be able to pull out equity on the house when you have sixty-eight thousand in arrears to bring the loan current that's the only question mark there that i don't know the answer to if you'd be able to pull out money on your house when yeah. you have that much in arrears i'm not sure on that i can check on that though um and see um but yeah i mean that's probably the best option that if your son wants it you know having having him take over the loan sub two also of course like you said there's repairs that need to be done as well um, but if that's something, you know, he's fine with doing and wants to do, it's just figuring out how 
he can get the money to bring the loan current and then also, you know, deal with the repairs as well. But uh, yeah, and mostly like what's what the pay what they're saying the payoff is in this in in this situation. Can the payoff be negotiated? Because I when I spoke with Myron, Myron said, "Well, I'll give you fifty thousand," and you know. And I'm like, but sixty eight thousand, and I was trying to think fast, but he thinks faster than I do. Yeah, well, <laughs> we haven't done this in years. So. You could do, and I saw someone in the chat say it. How about a loan mod? <laughs> Have you guys approached that route of of doing a loan mod? The only thing um, with the the loan mod is you'll kill that. You'll probably kill that two percent interest rate, though. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Usually that's yep, the case. I, I mean, I I did approach it, and that's when all this mess happened. Everything was approved. And then all of a sudden I get a letter on the same day that I get the letter from the share of sale stating that the note was sold to another mortgage company. And then uh -huh. they were, yeah. So then I call them, I say, can I do a loan mod or what can I do? And they're like, because they were giving me one week for the share of sale. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what do I do? So my attorney said, cause I'm still going through probate as well, but probate will be completed by Wednesday. And then that claims check was a claims check was coming in the estate of my dad and my husband. And um, Alex kind of knows the situation was going on. I was explaining to him in the beginning. And um, the she says after I complete the probate, they'll have to do the claims check over to me directly um, to get all that stuff fixed. So that's why I'm like, I have all that. I'm thinking the 24 grand is there to get it fixed. It's just the. It's just trying to deal with that sixty-eight grand that they want to pay it off. Uh, and the, and the other question is like, are those possibilities of negotiation, or does it have to be just you know paint exactly what they want, which is the sixty-eight k? Gotcha. And honestly, that's just something really to figure out with with the lender exactly, because I have no clue what they would you know their rules are in terms of like the loan mod and what they want. It would just be having a discussion with them. But I mean. I, I've worked with people in the past who get loan mods done where they owe a bunch of money to bring their loan current. And instead now that money's just got pushed to the back of their loan. Um, I've had some where it's like, it's almost like a silent second where that portion gets pushed to the back of the loan. That was mainly for like COVID relief stuff though. But if it's yeah. not like a COVID relief thing, usually that amount will get factored in back into the loan and the interest rate will go to like current rate. Cause there was a sub two deal I was trying to assign previously that the sellers kind of blew up on us and didn't take our retrade that we had to pitch once we got an inspection done. And then sure yeah. enough, like three months later, they come calling me back saying we can't sell our house on market. We did our loan mod though. Now our rates at 8.2% and the monthly payments way up. Um, and I'm like, I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me. I'm not going to touch that. So that's the thing. Like if you did a loan mod, that nice appealing interest rate that was lower would probably be higher. But then at the same time, if you did a loan mod, then you wouldn't have to worry about the 68K right now. So, I mean, if you went the route of like, if someone wanted to subtail it, meaning they took over the debt sub two, paid you a fee or something like that, and then listed it, that would be a lot easier. But I mean, honestly, I mean, I think there's a lot of things you can do with this one. Like, you know, it, it just depends. Do you want to give it to your son or not? Or do you want to try to just get as much money as possible out of it yourself? Because if you were going that route, I would probably... Um, either try to sell it to a cash buyer and really vet out a lot of different options or list it and try to go that route. But you're probably just going to get a cash buyer anyway because if it needs that much repairs, no one's really going to get approved for a loan on it conventionally. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, with a cash buyer, do I even um, do I even make any money? Because wouldn't they pay off only what's owed? And that's, then I that's, that's what I was thinking. I like with, the, a, with the cash buyer, it could be tight. Um, okay. it could be tight. Cause like, yeah. Cause I was looking at like, okay, let's say the house is worth like 400 K. Um, you know, a cash buyer would probably buy that at like 75% or something of value then factor out repairs. I mean, a cash buyer would probably be in this less than 300 K is my guess. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. And then you have 196. I mean, yeah, there could be a little spread there where you could make like 30 or 40, maybe if a cash buyer bought it. That's just my thoughts though, right? I haven't like underwrote this property and took a huge like deep dive into it, but cash buyer, I couldn't see you making more than, than 60 grand off of it. You probably okay. make anywhere from, from 
20 to 60, 30 to 60. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But then if All you right. went traditionally on the market, I mean, if people could buy it cash on the market, maybe you could get a little more. I mean, I think just taking action and moving forward, because it, it doesn't matter, right? Like say if you listed it on the market, that's at least, you know, doing a plan and trying to move forward while you try to figure other stuff out. Cause you could still do a loan mod or something while something's listed or figure it out then. Okay. Um, just cause I know For like, instance, if my, hu my, my husband, my son is trying to buy it, um, how would I create the contract? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Do I yeah. do a purchase agreement, a regular purchase agreement with contingents to appraisal inspection approval of financing uh i don't know what else i can't remember are you in sub are you in sub two monica yeah um i'm kind of like sharing it with another sub two student uh she had called me from arizona when this was like a few months ago so she's kind of on and off so i only have access whenever she has access gotcha until i can get blown get some stuff closed and be able to pay for it myself yeah i mean if you have access to sub two i would just go in and you could because i was gonna say i could help you out too but if you have access to sub two, you could just use the typical sub two purchase and sales agreement for a subject two deal. And that's what you could use. It's just the big thing to figure out for your son though, is that 68,000, how to bring that loan current, where's that going to come from and all that. Um, like, I mean, a good question could ask, you know, ask the lender, Hey, for that 68 grand, even though there's 68,000 in arrears there that I need to bring current. Um, like, <sighs> Yeah, I think you'd have to bring that current. I don't. I can't imagine you being able to take a HELOC out on your equity to pay that off. That's just my guess. But uh, yeah, let me let me think about it though, and let's let's definitely talk about it again though. Like okay. if you uh, if you text me kind of those docs and stuff, I'll take a look and um, I'll ask. I'll think about it myself too, and then I'll also ask a couple other people and kind of get their thoughts too as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And then I'm going to wrap things up here in a second. I'll just scroll through the chat quickly. Um, Christian. I had, the, I had the other question was with the sales agent because I'm meeting with her today at 430. And to me, it was kind of strange that she just said she couldn't give me any information until I stopped. I met her at the property. She would show me the property. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, to, to that's kind of strange. Yeah, that is strange. If it's close to you, though, and local, I would, I would and it looks like a deal, I'd still just go. But yeah, she should be giving you information. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, she's um, it's right around the corner. It's just that they're condominiums, and um, uh, let me see, HOA is three hundred and five dollars a month, which is really crazy. That's a lot because I only pay one hundred and fifty a year, so that's what she was saying. But like, how do um, I know approaching her about asking her all the questions and why they're selling it and the whole thing? But um, are there is there anything else that I need to ask her that? would be necessary to ask when you're at the appointment. I mean, is is this a cash deal? Is this a sub two? What's your plan with it? Um, well, she wouldn't give me any number. She was just wanting to meet me. So I'm just gonna take the step and get this fear out of me. Yeah. And so I would go and meet her, but um I need to ask her like the questions and you were mentioning something during, you know, during this Zoom um um of how how to approach the agent. Yeah. And I mean, if you don't know what the strategy is, if it's if it's like it's just a pre foreclosure that looks like it has some equity in there, um, you know, just walking the walking the property with her at the appointment, just asking about general condition. Obviously, you'll be there to see things, though, but asking if you know if there's any major issues, then maybe just saying is the, is the and this is a pre foreclosure, right? Um, It is. It, it, like people just abandon it and it, it's trashed inside, but not gotcha. as bad like in these. The carpeting is totally flat. Like there's no padding underneath. And that's on the lower level. It seems like it has three levels. It's three bedrooms, two and a half baths. I've been in those properties before because my daughter was looking into a, a place in that area a few years ago. Um, but those properties were under Fannie Mae and they were 104000 And now that she's pricing it at three thirty four nine, which I'm thinking, I honestly, I don't think the value is there. Yeah. in my opinion, but it is right down the street from our, we have like a golf course because it's like down the street from where I live and it's a golf course. Um, and then there's other residential homes, like right in front, like in their backyard, but right in front of it. Huh? So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would just, what all, like, do I ask yeah. her like, you know, um, like what is a seller trying to do? I know I had like a little, thing with um i know with alex was kind of stepping me through it like 
what is a seller trying to do? Um, like, I don't want to insult them, but I mean, the house seems like everything else, the kitchen looked pretty good on pictures, but it's just like the flooring needs to be done. There's a lot of trash in there, like beds all over the place, things like storage. I don't know. It just looked really messy. Then some other rooms look very like empty, like only a bed there in each room. So, yeah. but it was like one of those uh, metal beds with just like a really a quarter of an inch mattress and barely any blankets on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, honestly, I would just go and dive deeper to the motivation, their bottom line price and really emphasize on, oh, wow, this needs a lot more work than I thought it needed. Um, you know, and even if you don't know what you're talking about in terms of like repair costs and stuff like that, you know, oh, wow, this this looks like it needs more work than I thought. Uh, uh, and you're kind of pre -frame, pre framing that agent for a lower offer than what they want or have it listed at. And then also, of course, too, if it's in pre foreclosure, then there's underlying debt, you know, figuring out, well, hey, what's the what's the underlying debt on the property? Like, what's your seller trying to net off this? Because it looks like it, it does need, you know, substantial amount of work. Um, and when you go on that appointment, I would make sure you, you know, you take and up some updated pictures, video walkthrough, and then you can get other people's opinions on it too, of, of what the condition looks like and repairs. And if it's vacant, that's something, you know, that's good because they're not making any use of the property. It's not like they live there and they were about to lose their house. It's vacant and they're about to lose the house. So, yeah. Um, you know, there could be potential it is there. Vacant. Yeah. yeah, it is vacant. It's just like, there's a lot of stuff there, like everywhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jack. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I'll send um, you the stuff once I get, I get yeah, done with it. Yeah, no, that, that sounds good. Totally. Um, let Thank me see you. here. Of course. Um, Anthony, I saw you on mute. What's up? Yeah, I know. I was just going to say what – it's funny what you're saying there right now that, that, you know, it has a lot of stuff in it. It just reminded me of Pace when he talks about the bunnies, right? Because that's something she could utilize then if, like, hey, I, you know, I'll come in and clean all this out. Yeah. You know, they don't have to, the seller won't have to worry about where they're going to do whatever. Just I'll, we'll take it. We'll we'll clean the house out or whatever we need to do. So it's yeah. funny. Yeah. No. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for mentioning Thank you, that. Anthony. Yeah, that's really good because sometimes that's a huge hurdle for about people. The bunnies. Yeah. There's like, yeah. oh, there's so much stuff in the house, this and this. But literally, if you have a big fee, you can make. If you're making a ten thousand plus dollar fee and it costs you eight hundred dollars to get a moving crew out there for the day, hundred percent worth it. And then you can donate everything and get a tax write off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. Now, yeah. take in mind, I'm wholesaling these. So I have to kind of try to figure out the amount, right? That's. I mean, I'd still offer that because it's something that's so small. Like moving, like moving would be less than a grand. And I will shoot. I don't want to say that depending on if the house is jam packed. But ideally, probably be less than a grand, even if it's jam packed. You know, you could find some little local handyman guy or something. It doesn't have to be some big moving company, um, just someone with a truck even. And on your wholesale deals, you shouldn't be making less than $5,000 on a deal. So I, I would offer that regardless just to kind of push the deal forward maybe if that's a big holdup and just to make you stand okay. out from, you know, other offers. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of local there's a lot of local haulers that will come and clear stuff out because they'll just turn around and sell it. So they're pretty much doing it almost for free especially if it's old appliances and things like that that they want to get rid of, just have them come take everything and they'll just barely charge you anything or do it for free because they're going to turn around and try to sell it all themselves, you know? Definitely. Thank you.